All right, so Matt, we were walking down uh, the street downtown uh, the other day, and they had like this thing going on where you know different shops that were um, had people out, and they were selling the wares kind of on the street. You know, I guess farmers market type deal, but not really. Um, mm-hmm. So every time we passed a shop, somebody would say, "Hey, are you interested in soap or whatever?" Well, I walked by this one uh, building, and this guy kind of steps out. And he offers to sell me a coffin. And I looked okay. at the I looked at the guy and I said, Man, that is the last thing I'll ever need. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> it's good. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. (laughs) All right, everybody, here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? Hey, I'm doing good, brother. Excellent. Excellent. It's uh, I give you the graveyard uh, weather forecast. We're we're hot like everybody else is. It's hot. <laughs> um, we had a cold front come through today, so it dropped it down to 100 degrees. Yeah. Um, so it, it felt chilly out there. I almost had to put on long pants to go outside today. Uh, <laughs> <you're right. laughs> if you want to catch on fire. Yeah, right. <laughs> So real quick, we want to say go check out the Podbelly Network at podbelly.com. You can find a bunch of different shows to listen to. We're proud to be members of the Podbelly Network, and you can go on there and and search for all of the other members of the Podbelly Network, and you might find you a show that you never knew existed that you actually really love. So go over there and check it out, podbelly.com. Matt is actually wearing a Podbelly shirt tonight as we record. So if you're watching the video, you get to see their logo there. Um, while you're on the interwebs, is, 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 go over to patreon.com slash graveyard tales and you can sign up to become a patron. Um, we have one, five, and $10 members, and each one has, everyone gets a bonus episode a week, but each one has some different stuff that they get. Our $10 members, yep. they get video versions of the bonus episode plus video versions of us recording these main episodes. So if you want to see us record it, um, this one actually would be a good one uh, to be a $10 member for because you get to watch this episode on video. Um, Our $5 members, they get the audio and the video version of the bonus episode. And our $1 patrons just get the audio of the bonus episode. So go over there and check it out. If you're interested, become a patron. We couldn't keep doing this show without our patrons. You guys help keep us going. Um, your donations to the show really help us with equipment and just the cost that we incur running a show. So we we appreciate it and we couldn't do it without you guys. That's right. So Matt, that's all I've got uh, for the intro because it's going to be kind of a long episode. So why don't you tell us, what are we talking about tonight? All right. So tonight we're going to talk to um, a good friend of the show. Uh, he's been on before. Chris Williamson, Mm -hmm. and he hosts the Vanished podcast, and when we initially had him and his co-host, Jennifer Taylor, on the show, they were talking about, they were wrapping up um, the first season of Vanished, where they talked about the disappearance of Amelia Earhart, Mm -hmm. um, which is absolutely fascinating, and we're going to get into that a little bit with Chris, but um, just this month... Uh, Chris has released his book, and the book is called Rabbit Hole, The Vanishing of Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan. Yep. And it's it's based on all the information and research they got while doing the podcast uh, in in a in a long form book, Um, because, you know, maybe you just don't have the the time to listen to a show, but maybe Settling down with a good book is your thing. This is a way to absorb some of this 
fascinating information. And it's good to have and physical, like something physical in your hand sometimes. That's right. You know, that's right. Um, and I'm telling you, you, you will, you will not find someone as well versed in the Amelia Earhart case. Um, and as easy to talk to and relate this information as Chris Williamson. I, I promise you that. Yep. He's an encyclopedia. Um, and and he has he has dug down so many rabbit holes um uh, that he it, it's just every time I talk to him, I find out something else that I <laughs> either didn't remember or I didn't know at right. all. Right. So we're going to talk to him tonight about about the podcast. We're going to talk to him about what they've got coming up. We're going to talk to him about the book. We're going to talk to him about some paranormal stuff. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, you're going to enjoy it. We enjoyed getting to talk to Chris. So um, so settle back and uh, like I said, Adam, this is this went a little long because mm-hmm. uh, you know you get the three of us together and we could just we could do this for hours. Oh yeah, but, for uh, sure. But I think I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, so Chris Williamson coming up. All right, everybody. So here is the interview that we were teasing to you guys. We've got our buddy Chris Williamson here uh, in the graveyard with us tonight. How you doing, Chris? I'm I'm so honored to be here. Thanks both of you for for having me on. I'm doing really well. We're we're stoked to have you on again. Um, this one we'll get a little more uh, in depth into you. Where last time we we didn't really. We didn't get to know Chris, so we're going to try to <laughs> we're going to try oh to get to know Chris this time. So um, why don't you tell us uh, what do you do? You know, tell us about your shows and, you yeah. know, your interest. Do you like long walks on the beach with a glass of wine? <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll try not to tank your ratings uh, <laughs> on on this. But uh, yeah, it's, I mean, thank you for having me. This is a special show for me. Uh, Graveyard's uh, always been a, a special platform for me because uh, you guys, I don't know if you remember this, but you guys uh, were, we guessed it on your show, me and Jen. Uh, th- the night we guessed it was the night we wrapped recording uh, of, of season one of the show, which was, oh, yeah. I was in sort of a, I was sort of in a, I don't want to say a bad place, but I was, it was a real emotional place for me and it was a real difficult spot for me to be. And I I thought really that was going to be sort of my, my swan song and little did I know, uh, of course at that time. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've been doing podcasting for probably about five years now, not a whole uh, lot of time, but I run a couple of shows or ran uh, a, a show called chasing Earhart, which is sort of the, uh, I don't want to say the definitive Earhart podcast, but it was the only dedicated Earhart podcast. And I still, I believe it's still the only dedicated Earhart podcast. I think you're uh, right. There. Yeah. Yeah, it might be. Uh, I could be wrong on that. But we ran that for a long time in conjunction with a documentary we shot about 40 hours for called Chasing Earhart as well. And we were working behind the scenes on pitching that and the podcast kind of came out ahead of it and was meant to sort of serve as a, uh, a some really just supplemental material for the documentary uh, when you get right down to it. And uh, I also run a show uh, called Vanished, which came stemmed from an idea that I had about the Amelia Earhart case, which was if we had 200 eyewitnesses to a murder or to the disappearance of Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan, would that be a slam dunk in a modern day jury trial? If people Mm -hmm. were sitting and listening to all these different uh, theories on the case. And I reached out to uh, a woman who is now my co-host of the show and her name is Jennifer Taylor. And we started talking offline and she helped me breathe life into this idea for vanished. And the idea is uh, just a trial by jury, taking all these different cases that we cover, which you guys were so gracious and kind to sit in on our season two opener for Jack the Ripper. You guys worked with us on that. And we, we decided to sort of take the show, uh, you know, beyond Earhart and, and start doing a regular uh, seasoned show. And so we just finished season two with Ripper as our first case. And then John Wilkes Booth and D.B. Cooper and Henry Avery. And we've now announced a season three. Um, I also have another little show that I don't talk a whole lot about when I do publicity, but it's a show called Me and My Friends. And it's a little very little indie podcast that I do where I have people on uh, the show who I admire. Uh, I've had scientists, I've had authors, I've had historians. I mean, just a lot of different people on the show. And we talk about their craft and their, of course, fellow podcasters as well. 
and we just we have a good conversation it's sort of joe rogan-esque not as long of course but uh we just sort of talk about a lot of different topics and it's just all topics that interest me it allows me to sort of step outside of Earhart and sure. the comfort of our show and those are the shows i've i've been working on and one of them is retired chasing Earhart is no longer active but we have sort of tossed around the idea of maybe recording a fresh set of episodes for that because there's so much time has passed and uh, I've been I've just been sort of been doing that. And now we have this book, which is uh, sort of happened uh, almost by accident, just by sort of a, a slight demand and then sort of turning it into what it's become. So that's what I've been doing for the last uh, five to seven years now, probably. Yeah, I know you and I have talked about uh, me and my friends. And mm-hmm. um, that's one uh, that if you guys haven't checked out, you should go check it out because it is a it's a really interesting show. Just it's not in in the same vein as your other shows, which I think is cool. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a departure from uh, what you normally do, but it's one that you and I have talked about. Uh, Matt and I need to actually get on there and discuss with you because we can maybe discuss some things that aren't necessarily ghosts and uh, Mm -hmm. paranormal stuff. So, Yeah, it allows everybody to step outside their wheelhouse a little bit. And uh, that's what I love about the show. And we get to have people on that, uh, you know, are just like I said, they're just friends of mine. That's that's the, the name of the game and people I admire. And it's been a lot of fun. And hopefully uh, we, we will do a season three of that. And um, it's 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 a really good escape for me to just sort of record and and chat with people that I respect. So that's that's a lot of fun. I love that show. Yep. Uh, so Amelia Earhart is basically what got you into the the podcasting game. Um and and the documentary and stuff so what got you into amelia Earhart, and and why is her disappearance and her life and everything so important to you yeah it's just something that caught on early with me i got the bug for Earhart's legacy above all before uh i really understood the disappearance in any way shape or form so i started when i was a kid third grade i've told this story a few times i had these uh, there's these eight by 10 glossies that my teacher at the time threw around the room. And there's a real famous picture of Earhart with her hands on her hips. It's got the bomber jacket on and you can Google it right now. And that's mm-hmm. the picture that they had. Yeah. And I, I was intrigued by that picture. I was intrigued by who this woman was. I had no idea at the time. And I did a history day project on her. And I remember, I remember just coming back to Earhart every year for something for some, even as a kid, I just I remember not wanting to stop learning about her. And I I really couldn't tell you what it was when I first started. I just sort of had this attraction to the to the legacy. And ironically enough, I I sort of stepped away from it for a while after college and after I'd got my first degree. And after that, I I was sort of quiet for a while until I sort of had this idea for what would become Chasing Earhart before it ever had a name or even a structure. I wrote down a list of 25 names, which I've still got. And I thought if I could do a podcast on this or if I could reach out to these people, even before the podcast idea. And I so if I could reach out to these people and get them on record and have them talk about the life and the legacy, the disappearance, whatever they're working on, uh, that might make a pretty compelling sort of uh, project at the time. And I uh, I started that Chasing Earhart deal and I just sort of started reaching out. I remember it just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And everybody I asked to, to come on board said yes. And we ended up with a lot of people uh, that you normally wouldn't see pop up in an Earhart documentary mm-hmm. and uh, in an Earhart project of any kind. And we all of a sudden just got the ball rolling and it just sort of became white hot for a while. And we shot, uh, yeah, like I said, probably about 40 hours of footage uh, in the span of inside of six months. And we have all that archived and we probably shot 50 different individuals for that documentary in states all over the country. And you know, that was sort of where it led and, and the podcast sort of was out front of everything and it just it just became this deal. And so Earhart's always been a part of my life and it's really turned on for me in the last five to seven years about the same time that I came into podcasting. Really, I had this idea. Well, we have no geographical limitations when it comes to a podcast. We can mm-hmm. record with people all over the planet, as you well uh, know, and we can have a we can have a, a good conversation. We can get that ball rolling. And at the time that the case, it wasn't stagnant or anything by any stretch of the imagination, but I wanted to inject my ridiculous idea was I wanted to inject uh, some change into the case. I wanted to inject a different approach into the case. And that was everything I ever wanted. And we started to do that. And we really wanted to sort of be, uh, you know, 
uh, known as a catalyst, uh, you know, for change in the way the case is discussed and in the way historical mystery is discussed and just mm-hmm. even outside of Earhart, but just in general, there's so many of them as you guys are well uh, acquainted with now. So that's that's where it lies. And I've I've always done Earhart. It, it's always she's always been there in my life. Uh, my wife, we joke about all the time. She's like the other woman in my life. <laughs> and she always, you know, she always has been. So my, my wife is now competing with a woman who's been dead for 125 years, depending on who you believe. <laughs> Uh, or, you know, you know, who's been who's been alive, I should say, who would be 225 years. Let me correct that. Who about, about 125 years old and who's been dis, who's disappeared and has been missing for 85 years. Yeah. Uh, so very long time. And uh, it's it's a juggernaut of a case. And uh, it's it's the holy grail. As I will say that till ad nauseum. But it is. It's the holy grail. And uh, yeah, that's what that's that's really it just never left my consciousness. Never. And, you know, Chris, you said you wouldn't necessarily say that. Uh, chasing Earhart is the definitive Earhart right. podcast. I would, <laughs> um, and and I'll tell you why. Um, for most people that you know, they know who Amelia Earhart is. They like you, you know. They they remember studying about her in school. Um, maybe they read a book or two. Um, but the intricacies of the case, they they don't know. You don't get to that. Sure. And a lot of times that can be a little overwhelming, mm-hmm. but I think with chasing Earhart, um, you guys approach it in such a manner that for the average person that just says, I don't really, I don't know any more than what I know from grade school mm-hmm. about Amelia Earhart and her disappearance. It, it allows them to absorb that in, in such a way that they don't feel like, Oh my God, this is so technical. It's like it's like taking a class in college or something. And yeah. it, it makes the subject a little bit more user friendly. And when that happens, then you begin to realize, oh my God, mm-hmm. you know, there was so much involved with this. So um, much. That that you you never even realized. Um, but like I said, the average person wouldn't wouldn't probably dig that deep. Mm-hmm. Um, so you did the digging for everybody, but <laughs> I think where you stand out is you put it in a format that most people could consume easily mm-hmm. and, and it, and it draws you in. Oh, yeah. well, uh, that's, that's a big deal coming from you. So thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And that means a lot. I know I, I found, I don't know how I found it, but I found, um, the chasing Earhart podcast prior to meeting you, talking to you or whatever. And mm-hmm. so after listening to it and then you and I connected, I don't even know how we connected, probably <laughs> uh, our probably mutual Scott friends. And yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Sure. I think it was probably through uh, Scott and Forrest. Um, but I remember us connecting and I was like, that's really cool because I have listened to this podcast. I did that geeky thing that a lot of us do when <laughs> you listen to a podcast and then you start talking to the person that does that podcast. Yeah. Um, so that, that was really cool. And it's, it, it stuck with me from, uh, first listening to it. Cause like Matt said, it's, it's a digestible format and sure. I think it's still awesome. How many people you have talked to and interviewed for the Earhart case, because I yeah. know Matt and I, we would like to interview more people, but hmm. in our field, the the paranormal field you've got one of two options you've got people who don't really want to talk about it because they Mm -hmm. may have had an experience but they don't want to talk about it because they don't want to get ridiculed or picked on or or you know looked down upon because of their experience or you've got the people who capitalize on it and have a tv show and are way more famous than matt and i so it's hard to <laughs> get anybody in that uh, in that lane where we can interview them and everything. And it, it just it makes me a little jealous that in in your lane, you've got <laughs> all these people that, um, you know, you, you can talk to and have intellectual discussions with about the case. And yeah. I mean, it does in the sense of the mystery aspect of it, it fits right in with what Matt and I do, because we've started doing more historical mysteries here lately. Um, the oh, yeah. paranormal mysteries and stuff. So, um, 
I, I like you have heard about Amelia Earhart my whole life. Yeah. And uh, it's the, the thing that I still am drawn to about it is all this technology we have, all the abilities mm. that we have, we can mm-hmm. send submersibles down to the Titanic. You know, we can, we can get on submersibles and go down to the Mariana trench and we can get into space, but we still mm-hmm. haven't found Earhart. So it's wild, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it makes me wonder, is it a, a natural disappearance or was mm-hmm. there something weird that mm-hmm. happened that, cause that's the way my brain always goes is yeah, sure. what, what sure. could be abnormal, the paranormal mm-hmm. aspect to it. And yeah, Matt and I have discussed uh, time slips and wormholes and stuff like that. And yeah. I've always wondered, she's out there flying by herself with Noonan, just her and Noonan. Right. What, right. what could she have flown into? You hear about the Bermuda Triangle all the time, mm-hmm. taking mm-hmm. ships and all that. That can't mm-hmm. be the only place. So what right. if what if she found oh, yeah. that? And mm-hmm. that's why we can't find plane, body. We got nothing. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's compelling, right? It's uh you you explained it beautifully. It's you have people that are exploring all reaches of of everything you can think of and we're looking still for a, a 39 and a half foot airplane uh with a 55 foot wingspan in an area that's roughly the size of Texas. Yep. And if you're believing that she disappeared uh, just like, you know, history is written and states that she was around 200 miles out, around 100 miles out from Howland Island, which is a near impossible island to find. Uh, you know, even if you Google Earth it now, it's a speck in the middle of the, you know, the Pacific. I, it's it's tiny. I was going to say when when we first talked, I I did exactly that. Yeah, sure. And I was like, how the hell would you find that place today? Right. Yeah. Well, much less yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah, with G- with with no GPS in play, uh, using celestial navigation. Granted, the 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 gr- one of the greatest, if not the greatest, celestial navigator to ever live. Uh, so, I mean, if you're going to have someone in the airplane with you, that's the guy yeah. you want to have in the airplane with you at that time. But Earhart was, you know, this icon, and so you, she's 39 years old. Just she disappears just shy of her 40th birthday, and she didn't have a very long career. And she accomplished so much in that tight time frame. And she disappears at the height of her popularity. So think of what you've got here. You've got, imagine the most famous person on the face. Imagine for lack, whether you love him or hate him, imagine Donald Trump disappearing off the face of the planet tomorrow mm-hmm. with no explanation eight decades after he disappears. Or imagine Richard, Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos going on this exploratory mission somewhere, whether it's to outer space or wherever, and or James Cameron, right? And they just vanish into thin air. Yeah. And Earhart was was arguably the most famous person on the face of the earth when she disappeared. So you look at something like D.B. Cooper. I like to use this example. D.B. Cooper was a nobody. You could walk by D.B. Cooper a thousand times and never know it was him. He mm-hmm. was, we don't know, he has no beginning and he has no ending. We don't know, he existed for around five hours. Earhart is polar opposite of that. And she's this woman that's that's out in, in all these different platforms. She's teaching it, she's consulting at Purdue University. She's lecturing and making, you know, a, roughly, you know, a million and a half dollars a year in today's money on a lecture circuit. She's the face of women in aviation and she just disappears into thin air. And, uh, you know, they had a lot of, you know, you have a lot of explanation to to back the official U.S. explanation for her disappearance, uh, her and Noonan's disappearance, which is that they just ran out of gas. So just a lot of little a lot of time. And we've had people that uh, uh, Tom Detweiler, who's a giant in the industry, who was uh, just part of our virtual launch, is one of the he was the operations manager for Titanic when they found it. I mean, he's right in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. He knows what he's talking about and you've got a lot of scientific explanation to back the idea that they're somewhere in that deep ocean roughly eighteen thousand feet below the surface of the water and but it's a it's a crapshoot man you've got to you've got to get real lucky uh, at three to four million dollars a day searching yep. the deep water oceans it's going to take somebody like a bezos or someone that says what do you need 150 million here you go and it's nothing to them mm-hmm. uh, or you're going to find something in a file and a previously redacted name or sentence or something, or 
there are some really interesting paranormal sort of aspects to it. And people ask us all the time, the idea that she had yeah, maybe the Bermuda triangle interfered, or maybe she was in an area of, uh, you know, the, uh, of the ocean where, uh, they had a lot of skip and a lot of, a lot of stuff that was in play that maybe she wasn't any, anywhere near there. One of the theories is that she turned around and went back about halfway and that she was on a nighttime frequency in the Itasca, which is a little coast guard cutter, that was laying in wait off the, the shores of Howland to guide her in to refuel and to replenish her supplies and all that jazz. The idea that uh, maybe she was on a nighttime frequency, she was nowhere near Howland Island, and mm-hmm. that because of the skip and the ionosphere and the way that works and the bounce you can get, you can get a signal 3,000 plus miles away. You know, yeah. that's possible. And the Itasca could be the Itasca, they're furiously writing down these, you know, these signals S5, 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 which means that that's the strongest signal strength you can attain at that time. But Leo Bellarts, who's on, who was on our show through a really cool piece of technology, steps outside the radio room and he can't see her and he's expect he's expecting to see her he's like she's so loud she's so clear that i i step outside and i expect to see her coming right through the clouds right over the top of the ship and she never shows up yeah. and that's really remarkable for that time because you don't have much technology that you could say well maybe something happened tech- technologically that it's just a radio that's basically mm-hmm. they had two-way radio communicate they never established two-way radio communication with the Itasca. that's the, that's the simple plain truth uh, she was supposed to get you have point a point b you leave lay new guinea you have harry balfour at lay who was a radio the radio man of, of guinea airways who was uh she's exiting one area and then when she gets far enough and close enough to the Itasca, they'll start getting uh, an s1 then pull an s2 and s3 so on and so forth as she gets closer and closer and closer and her words are saying verifying that i'm i must be on you but cannot see you Mm-hmm. It's kind of weird. And then as soon as she goes down and, you know, in the middle of the Great Depression, they're spending this absorbent amount of money to search for her and nobody comes up with anything. And 85 years later, anytime anybody has come up with anything that they think is tangible, they strike out. So this is this is really we have nothing. We have nothing. After 85 years, we have some interesting stuff that's compelling, but we have nothing tangible on any of these theories. I don't care what anybody would come on and tell you. Nothing's tangible. Right. None of it's right. concrete yet. And. Until then, it's a big fat mystery. It's a big fat question mark. And we don't like question marks as a human race. And that's why people care so much because you add that to the idea that she's who she says, you know, she's who she was uh, the most famous woman ever. Uh, And still to this day, one of the most famous women ever. Mm -hmm. So I don't Mm -hmm. know if you guys noticed, but there's there's a new story going. She's getting her statue at the Capitol. Uh, there was just it was just added. If you Google Google search her for uh, news, you'll see the statue huh. articles come up. I mean, she's you know the accolades just just keep coming. Oh yeah, you know, eighty five years after she's no longer with us, and it's remarkable. And who has that kind of staying power? Right, right. Yeah. Name five women that have that kind of staying power. Yeah. Nobody can do it. <laughs> yeah. Nobody can do it. Yeah. You know. So that's why we're here. That's that's why we did the book. That's why we did the show. That's why you know that's why people should care is because this is a very unique situation that we're looking at right now it really is and Mm -hmm. the the fact that you know you were saying they've got the s5 signal but they can't see her that's why Mm -hmm. i think a lot of people go to the paranormal thing is right you know we we've discussed the alternate dimensions one sitting on top of another well if somehow she were to cross that plane into another dimension she could be in that area Right off, Howland, right off Howland Island, but yeah. not in this dimension. And she's still able yeah. to contact the Atasca and all that to get this signal, but they just don't see her because uh, it, think about um, Stranger Things and the Upside Down. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, they can communicate yeah. between, but they can't see each other. So yeah. what yeah. if... 80 years from now, 85 years from now, we figured out other dimensions. And then all of a sudden Mm -hmm. we're like, that's where Amelia has been this whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love, I love that stuff. I mean, I love the, I love the, um, you know, that really just the, the, the fun that it entails of just speculating. That's one of my favorite things to do is just to speculate on what, what could have happened you know to her what what might have happened what might she have done when she returned uh Mm -hmm. you know that's all speculative at this point but a lot of these theories are are really wild and they're really uh you know just like there's a lot of huge levels to them 
and it, yeah, it's it's so convoluted. It gets so convoluted in some of the stuff, and it, it rely a lot of these series rely on what might have happened. Yeah, and uh, it, it's it's all speculative. So for me, creating a project like Chasing Earhart, we never did any any paranormal sort of aimed episodes, but we had talked to a lot of people that you know written books that you know I was Amelia Earhart in a prior life. Um, you know, a lot of different really interesting stuff that that gets really sort of, you know, into the, to quote Forrest, into the woo woo, right. Into the, into the strange, but yeah. a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, Earhart, there's no, uh, I think because the mystery endures so much and it's, it's become so dominant over the case, there's no, you know, everything's on the table. I mean, it's, it's, it's all a crap shoot and uh, to, you know, basically pick your theory, pick your poison and just have fun with it and run with it at this mm -hmm. point. And um you know, that's sort of this book is a, a, a slight representation of that. But uh, yeah, there's there's so much more. There's so much more where this book came from as far as the amount of theory of, and, and on Earhart. And it, you just can't get it all in one book. It's an, it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, if you would, Chris, talk a little bit about some of the things that have been found that have that people have tried to connect to mm -hmm. to uh, to Amelia Earhart. But there, you know, there's always something. It, it's like yeah. I always say, it's we're gonna shove this square peg into this round hole mm -hmm. until we get it in there, Lots and then once once we succeed, done, solved, we yeah. got it. Yeah, absolutely. Confirmation bias runs rampant through this. I mean, it poisons this whole case. It really does. And it, you know, it's not unlike DB Cooper and some of the other ones, of course. This isn't like exclusive to this case, but it's there. And every time somebody finds anything tan that they think is tangible, uh, it either gets debunked, it gets sort of, it kind of weans out and it, it doesn't, it gets white hot for a little bit and just kind of fades away, uh, or it gets, you know, whatever the case is, or it just, it kind of stalls. Right. Mm -hmm. And so multiple theories have that crash and sync doesn't really have that crash crash and sync relies sort of heavily on the science and the radio logs and the Atasca and the people that were there that day. And, and, and I have a lot of respect for that, of course, as a, as a, someone who's covering the case but with castaway the idea that she uh happened upon gardner island or nicomaroro island now as it's now known at the time they they happen upon this island they put the plane down and and you know they try to send these post loss radio signals if you believe that theory if you go with that idea they were there on that island on Nikamaroro for a, a, a while. We don't know if Noonan died on impact or had suffered a fatal head injury, but we know that Earhart, according to that theory, Earhart would have been on that island for days, for weeks, for months, maybe on her own. And they have found evidence of Rem, not remains, but uh, well, they found they found that too. They, they found uh, you know the heel of a woman's shoe, the heel of a man's shoe. They found a, a sextant that they believe that maybe Noonan would have owned or would have had, but they sort of further research determined that maybe wasn't Noonan's sextant. They found remnants of a campfire, turtle shells, bird uh, bird and fish shells, and things of uh, that would sort of indicate that somebody was there at that time. Mm -hmm. But for Castaway, Nicomaroro is a very highly trafficked island for an air for a spot that's in that position on the globe. It's they had the SS Norwich City, which ran aground there with several men on board, you know, several years before Earhart and Noonan would have happened upon the island. They had a coconut plantation there at one point. So every time some, you know, Tiger, uh, the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, who's that's the group that champions the idea that they were castaways. Every time they they build up, they build up a lot of circumstantial evidence. So if you're sitting in a courtroom, it, it might sell you, you know, the idea that, hey, this is likely what happened to them based off the evidence we have. But they've never found anything concrete. There were bones found discovered there that if you guys remember just a few years ago, Dr. Right. Richard Jantz, who's yeah, he's a he's a famous forensic anthropologist, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, uh, one of the most knowledgeable guys you'll ever meet you know, re-examined re and re-looked at with the help of some of Tiger's resources, uh, the bones that were found in the early 40s um, on that island, and they were thought to be of a Polynesian male or, you know, someone who was much taller. Well, Earhart was actually a tall woman for the time. Yeah. She was 5'8", five, 5'7", yeah, five, five, So she was tall. And, uh, you know, further study, of course, determines that there's a 99.9% .9 likelihood that the bones found on Nika Mororo are are closer to Earhart than anybody that they would have previously examined or anybody in a, in a control group that they, they looked at. 
99.9% gets thrown around this case so much. Mm. That number is all, and you know, you guys have heard that in other cases too. Everybody loves that 99% number. Mm -hmm. And because it gives, it gives everybody an out. Well, I didn't say it was a hundred percent. It's possible that it could be, you know, I could be wrong. There's a little bit of wiggle room the the smallest amount, same thing with Japanese capture. That's a monster theory. I mean, that's been around since forever. And, you know, it started with Fred Gurner, really started prior to Fred Gurner, but Fred Gurner popularized it. And they found so much what they figure is tangible information. There are so many stories. If you guys focus on the idea, if you start with 200 witnesses in and around the Marshall Islands and Saipan that either came into contact with Earhart, with Noonan or the Electra or a combination of those three, there's a lot of evidence uh, to support the idea that they may have been there. They even had stamps to commemorate her coming, you know, landing in the lagoon there or crash landing or being shot down. It really depends on where you decide to go and what line of theory you decide to to get specific with. But uh, that is a, a a monster theory with lots of evidence, especially from the military that was there. And I'll tell you I'll tell you one story that's glaring. That's it's in the book and we talk about it. It's in the original show. There are uh, some uh, military personnel that are on uh, in that area after World War II, and they're going through. You know, they've blown that area to hell, and it's a war zone, of course. And these military GIs, these young guys, are going through the remnants of buildings that are some, somehow semi-standing or whatever. And uh, they're going through. There's a gentleman by the name of Robert Wallach, who is one of the most famous accounts of of military personnel in Earhart in the Earhart case. And they go through uh, these buildings and they find this safe. And he uh, happens to have a demo guy with there. They blow the, the the doors off the safe. He's got this briefcase in the safe that he finds. And he thinks it's full of yen or something. He's going to be a rich Marine. He says like he's, he's running out and he's going to get that as a spoils of war. He gets out there. He gets to a place where he feels safe. He pops it open or he opens it and it's full of Earhart's passports and papers and all this mm. stuff. And it's bone dry. And he's thinking his first thought is, wait a minute. They told us that she crashed in the Pacific. Why this stuff's bone dry? Why is it wet or why is it not wet or soaked or at the bottom of the ocean? So he gets a little pressure from his fellow uh, Marines to turn it in because these guys were honorable men, you know, and they, they did that and that's what they were supposed to do. And he finds a guy. I love how Forrest Burgess from Astonishing Legends says, let's put the little scrambled eggs on his, on his hat. You know, like that's how they identified like officers, right? Yeah. And they were supposed to give spoils to officers. And if they're not claimed, they can get them. So this guy, he walks up to this guy and he gives, he tells him what it is and he gives it to him and he looks at it and he opens it and he, he, and he, he says, okay, great. And he, he writes him, he actually gives him, can can I cuss on this show? I can cuss on this show, right? He gives him a receipt. He gives him, he gives him a receipt, right? He writes out Amelia Earhart's paperwork, passports, all that stuff. Right. And he gives it to him. And uh, later in the war, he's mortally wounded. He survives, but he's mortally wounded. And he's, he takes this receipt when he gets it. He puts it in his money belt that he has with him. And he takes it with him everywhere. And he gets this receipt. He's got it on him. He gets injured later. And they're having to remove his clothes and stuff to attend to his injury. And he keeps telling him, save the money belt. Like he knows he's got like the Holy Grail on him, basically, mm-hmm. if, if he's right. And they, they don't. And the oh, money geez. belt's lost. And the receipt's lost. So there's there's... Uh, scenarios full. I mean, they run rampant through this whole case regarding uh, stuff like that. And the Japanese capture theory is just one uh, of tangible. There's so many. There's a supposedly she was in custody and she was watched by some different people. And one of the people that had her uh, in custody gave you know got got a ring from her. We don't know where the ring's at. Uh, there was a kim- there was a kimono. There was like all these different things where she was in custody. And all of it's gone. Now, the briefcase, we don't know. It could be sitting in an archive somewhere or something. And that's mm-hmm. kind of the exciting part about, you know, uh, this whole thing is you never know what you might turn over um, in this case. But, yeah, to answer your a very long winded answer to your question, there's it runs rampant. There's yeah. case there's there's cases of of evidence found uh, all throughout multiple theories. And there's a, a really big, big piece of evidence that is on the Project Blue Angel side, which is an actual aircraft that they're trying to determine right now, you know, whether or not that's the Electra or just a Electra or maybe a different plane that's really close. Uh, but they've ruled out a lot of different possibilities right now, and they're trying to step forward with that. And, uh, you know, that could be it. If it's if Bill Snavely and Project Blue Angel, if that's right, uh, they could be sitting on the airplane right now. They could be in less than 150 feet of water right now. Wow. 
Um, and it seems like it'd be a slam dunk. You could just get down there real quick and you can almost free dive and get some Uh information off that plane, but it's wrapped in uh, a coral shell that happens to be about four feet thick. Um, in one of, in one of the most, um, unstable nautical environments on the face of the earth. If you're looking at this on, on, on paper, uh, 18,000 feet down, you guys see the images of the Titanic pretty pristine, actually. Uh-huh. I mean, it was pretty much yeah. it, it. They were pulling papers off that, like newspapers off that and money off paper, money off that and everything. This is a very different scenario if Bill Snavely's right. And he's got to sort of uh, work on that very gingerly and try to get the right budget, the right crew, the right, you know, everything down there to Buka so they can put this one to bed. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's it's a case that's never dull. Uh, it never lulls for very long. And I think uh, in the next six months, you'll probably find some revelations or discover some revelations on multiple theories in this case when they decide to come forward. So from then on, we just wait. Yeah, basically, the, the thought that there could be a briefcase sitting mm. in an archive somewhere is fascinating <laughs> because as we all know, there's in museums, they have backlogs of. Uh, just uh, let's say uh, dinosaur mm-hmm. remains that they have a, a hundred years worth of work there mm-hmm. that they still haven't gone through. So there is a possibility that this evidence is just sitting in some museum back room somewhere and somebody just hasn't gotten to it yet. And eventually somebody will get to it and go, Oh yeah, this here's the paper says what happened to her. Yeah, yep. redacted and, maybe previously. Yep. Yeah. That's that's how they. There's a very famous photo called the Jaluit dock photo. It's part of Amelia Earhart, the lost evidence. You can if you Google that, it's Earhart and Noonan on that dock. You know that's a it was a real famous white hot photo for a while. And again, another another thing we talk about in the book with Les Kinney, who discovered who who had the photo. He, he perfect example, Adam, of what you're talking about. He had the photo. And he didn't think twi- he didn't look at it twice. Like mm-hmm. it's just like those things you ah, put away, and then you know, six months later, a year later, ten years later, you're going through your stuff. And you're like, what the hell is this? You pull it out, you give it another close examination, and he was like, holy shit, this is what is this is amazing. This is Earhart potentially Earhart and Noonan, and that was just from an art from the National Archives. He had found that, and that became a center of a documentary. It was lit the whole world on fire when it came to Earhart being potentially found or proven to be in Japanese custody, which would. I can tell you right now, if, if Japanese capture is ever proven to be the truth, it's going to change the game when it comes to, uh, you know, Earhart's legacy, uh, you know, it, whether it damages it or whether it strengthens it uh, remains to be seen. But if that proves to be true, it's it's going to be staggering. I mean, st- there's no word to describe how staggering that revelation will be if that happens. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because. That's one of the the theories that I think a lot of people lean toward, but they hope is not true. Because yeah. agreed, uh, you know it, it it would be disappointing that mm-hmm. she was captured, and then whether our government hid it because they didn't want people to know. Oh, she got captured by. The Japanese, because it was a very tumultuous time um, Mm -hmm. with our relations and, you know, with with Japan Mm -hmm. and it it would be disappointing on so many fronts that Mm -hmm. I think, like you said, it would completely change this case. Um, If if she was found to crash, then case would just go on and people go, yeah, that that's what we thought happened. Mm -hmm. But. Yeah, it would it would not just rock the boat. It might flip the boat over if it was yeah. found that she was captured. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Absolutely. It's none of these endings are pleasant. None of these endings are no. pleasant. And it's it's not it's sad because she either, you know, imagine crashing. Imagine crashing in the middle of the ocean. You know, she talks about putting flying at a thousand feet. We don't know why she did that uh, the only, the best guess or the, the guess that i can think of is that she was trying to perform something called a pancake landing which is really just trying to put the plane down on the water as gingerly as possible mm-hmm. so that way it would it might float it might have the best chance at floating and a lot of people that worked on that plane 
have told us or told people that have been part of the project that, you know, they're no longer alive today. And they've told us that, you know, they, they told them basically, uh, Hey, that, that plane would have been like a ping pong ball with wings. If, if it was put down an, in a right position, Earhart was a pretty skilled pilot. She walked away from 11 crashes in her career. She crashed her fair share of airplanes. She knew how to put a plane down. She knew how to handle herself. Mm-hmm. And Noonan, uh, you know, would have had really a lot of great input too. You know, it's possible that that plane, uh, that they just sank and what a terrible, terrible way to die in the middle of yeah. the ocean. You know, you're sinking, you can't swim or whatever the case, you can only swim for so long. They're not going to get to you either that, or she's executed and or beheaded or kicked into a shallow grave and her remains are somewhere in the Marshall islands or Saipan, or she dies alone of dysentery in Garapan prison, which is still standing by the way, the remnants of it. Oh wow. Or she dies alone as a castaway on an Island. Can you imagine that? Yeah. You know, that fate mm. and uh, or, you know, even if, if you buy the repatriation idea, which is the, the best case scenario, I think, in all of these, she ends up on the East Coast and she never flies again. And part of it, part of the deal of bringing her back is that she's she's already been de- declared dead and absent uh, absentia by this time. So you can't speak to your mother. You can't speak to your former husband. You can't speak to your sister. I mean, people you love, you're dead for all intents and purposes. You are dead and you have mm-hmm. to remain that way or we don't bring you back. She has to agree to that. It's a terrible scenario either way. Yeah. And um, it, there, there's, there's no happy ending here. And, uh, you know, that's sort of the sad part about it. Someone of that stature, of that iconography uh, dies like that. Uh, that's why people should care is because we need to have an ending. We need to have a period on that. We need to turn that question mark to a period. Right. Uh, and, and, and finalize this thing. I don't care personally who's right. I, it's a great possibility that maybe a few of these theories have a piece mm-hmm. and that they need to put it mm-hmm. together. And what's really stopping this from completing is that there's a lot of behind the scenes drama, a lot of behind the scenes infighting and a lot of, a lot of stuff that comes with these cases, uh, that, for lack of a better term, taints the whole case and poisons it. And uh, that might be what we're dealing with here. And and if, if people don't, you know, come together and work this out, reach across the aisle, so to speak, however you want to word it, uh, this case might be destined to stay uh, in the same position it is right now. And, and wouldn't that be sad that the, the reason why it never gets solved is people keep getting the people that are investigating it uh, are getting in the way of each other. And that's right. that's 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 disappointing. Yep. I, I agree with you there. Um, because it the the infighting causing a problem to me um it, it seems worse than just there's a government cover up because we know the government covers stuff up all the time i mean right. they've been doing it for uh, since man created a government they have been right. hiding stuff yeah. from their people yeah um, and for different reasons, of course, but yeah, right, absolutely. Right. So, uh, I I can, I could see and not be super disappointed by the fact that there was repatriation and they covered it up. Uh, mm-hmm. There was they knew that she died in a Japanese prison and they covered mm-hmm. it up. I mm-hmm. I can wrap my head around that, but the fact that she may have had this terrible accident and you've got. Mm three or four groups of people that each one of them maybe has a piece of this puzzle, Mm -hmm. but because they're fighting with each other and they're unwilling to share information or, you know, because they want the whole glory and they don't want to give this little bit of information to somebody else, then none of them are going to figure it out. None of us will Mm -hmm. know what happened Mm -hmm. because, they don't want to share this quote unquote glory of figuring out what happened. I think that would be severely disappointing if that's the case. Yeah. You guys remember when nine 11 happened and all the independent agencies were not making a whole lot of headway in the, in the immediate aftermath of nine 11. And the reason why is because they were all hoarding information. Everybody had their own set of facts. Everybody had their own set of information and details. And only when they opened up and started sharing that information, could we become a more, could could we have a more cohesive defense against, uh, you know, not only domestic terrorism, of course, but international terrorism was the the thing, of course, at that point with all that. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's not to, not to compare the two. That's a very different scenario, of course. And uh, 9-11 is a very tragic thing. And it's, but I'm just sort of comparing it in the sense of, of sharing information. That's really oh, yeah. how you get uh, really to the next level. 
of these cases is you share that information and that's how it works. I mean, that's, you know, that's how you get, make breakthroughs uh, collectively. There's, I say this in every podcast I do, but it, it, it's probably the most important thing. There's been this terrible collapse, a spectacular collapse of, of any kind of collaboration in this case whatsoever. Uh, what's really nice though, in the recent months or the recent time uh, that's passed is you're starting to see people reach across the aisle a little bit and you're starting to see people gain interest in other people's work and other people's theories. Well, maybe we should check this one out. Hey, this one is kind of compelling. We don't know what's the, you know, whatever the case is. And you're starting to see a little bit of collaboration. And that is uh, for me, it's like, I can let my shoulders relax now. It's like, yeah. okay, it's actually starting. They're, they're starting to crack through and, and make, make a potential breakthrough here. And um, I, I'm, I'm happy to support everybody. I'm happy. That's, that's always been my given position in this case is, is not to be the expert. It's to be the other guy on the side that's supporting people. That's asking questions. That's interviewing. That's getting people to open up and share their work. And hopefully through our archive and through this book now and through the show and, and all that stuff, people will start to look at that and, and try to maybe use that as a foundation to, to put things together and to make some change positively in this case. And I think you're starting to see that. And that's a, that's a lovely, lovely thing to see yeah. that. So it's not all doom and gloom, but it's, 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 a, it's definitely an, up, an uphill climb for, for yeah. Amelia Earhart in this case, for sure. Absolutely. It's not all doom and gloom. It's just partial doom and gloom. Which partial doing yeah. we're partial. used to that 50 percent 50 percent yeah 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 i'll give you halfway on that yeah <laughs> yeah so um you've mentioned your book a couple times um before i get into asking you some weird paranormal questions mm. um tell us title of your book where people can get it and and what they can expect from the book yeah ask uh so so the the book is you know, it's really sort of my coup de gras. It's uh, my, uh, you know, it's it's my my swan song. I always I say this ever. I seem like I say this all the time on your show, but it's my swan song. Hopefully, for real this time. And uh, it really was birthed out of the idea of people asking for a written transcript of the show. That's really it was simple as that. People said, "Hey, you know, we have an audience that sort of skews a little bit older, and and they may not consume podcasts in the same way that you you know we all consume it here. Might not be their 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 consumption of." choice mm -hmm. and they want something tangible to hold and, and i i totally got that and it just it just became a, a request that we get uh starting early in the show like maybe two or three episodes in uh and uh you know we got enough of it where people it's all of a sudden just started to seem possible you know and i could i started editing this transcript in this this uh original show about two and a half years ago before i had a publisher before i had anything going on i was just doing it privately got about a year into it uh publisher came aboard a uh, lovely publisher called beyond the fray and they worked with me and uh we had some uh you know we had some great success with that and it was exciting and then it just sort of didn't work out in the end for a lot of behind the scenes reasons but the idea that we were sort of i was sort of too far gone now like i had to I had to finish it i was at the <laughs> yeah. time that that happened i was probably 90 percent done with the book we had tweaked it multiple times uh, we had worked on this thing and all of a sudden we've got this monster of a book and people can sort of expect if you've never heard the show uh, you know, we don't have a whole lot of spoilers in, in, in the book, but the, the show sort of, you know, like I said early in, the, in this uh, conversation, it's a trial by jury format. So we start with the cradle and we go to the disappearance and then we try to cover the 85 years since the disappearance and everything that's happened uh, on the case and these multiple theories uh, since then. And the the book is a really just a representation. We cover four theories in the book. We cover Crash and Sink. We cover Castaway. We cover Buka. And we cover Japanese Capture. So that's a lot of content uh, in the book. And the way we do it is my co-host will... Uh, you know, I, I will do a direct examination of my of my experts for a given theory. And uh, for that theory, I'm all in. I'm on board Crash and Sink or whatever we're pushing for that particular episode. And my co-host, Jennifer Taylor, who is a, a real life, you know, was a criminal defense attorney. Now I think she works in construction litigation and stuff like that. But she was doing criminal defense at the time, uh, comes in and gets to cross examine my witnesses, my experts, which is a. Uh, totally different format than anything that had ever come before it when it comes to yep. the Earhart case. The, the goal was, how do you do this new? How do you do this different? How do you do this fresh? And that's my, that was my big idea. I came up with that and Jen was a, a really a big part of that idea and helping flesh it out and breathe life into it. And so this book sort of is like a, 
it kind of switches and pivots on you about halfway through the book, which is pretty interesting. It You talk about the life, the disappearance um, in, in one book, but the, the life part of it, the legacy part of it, we touch on all these different areas so people can understand why this woman was so important. And uh, then we get to the disappearance, which is like the juiciest disappearance of all time. And we get into all the science and we get all the, the, the different representation of different, uh, you know, uh, corners of investigation for all these different theories. And we let the jury, which is our readers or our listeners in this case for the show, uh, decide for themselves. We don't we don't make any grand. I don't make any grand uh, declarations at the end of what I believe or anything. We offer color commentary just like you guys do on your show on different cases and different things that are out there in the ether. And we just aim all of our commentary at this one case and we we go into very great detail uh 800 plus pages worth of detail uh for this book and it's it's to my knowledge uh and i could be wrong on this but i hope i think i'm right the largest written effort uh ever on Earhart because it's it's you've got almost 50 experts across the span of this entire book covering everything that you can think of from the 99s to her relationship with Purdue to her time in Hawaii with the ground loop to uh, the 1929 air derby that she, you know, catapulted, you know, a female aviation um, uh, with. And then, um, of course, the disappearance. And then we start covering all these different theories and we have all the representation. So it's a definite uh, you know, it's a definite deep dive, but from some of the reviews I've heard so far, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to consume. It's conversational in format and it doesn't read like this big, long history book. It reads, you can take snapshots of this, mm-hmm. um, and you can read through segments or chapters or not chapters. I'm sorry. Um, uh, theories and things of that nature. And you can decide at the end, it's up to you. I've always, uh, if I make any declaration in the book, it's, it's that Amelia and Fred belong to history. So they belong to all of us, right? They're, they're collectively ours now and uh, they're historical figures. And so now you decide, you know, if you were reading through the book, Matt, you might think it's absolutely Japanese capture after you, you might be mm-hmm. bought and sold by that. Absolutely. And, and Adam, you might think it's, it's crash and sink. It's just, it's too, it's too, uh, too strong, you know, crash and sink is too strong, but that's sort of the beauty of the book is you guys can reach the, reach the end of a book and have different conclusions of what you believe. And we can open up a discussion much like we're having now. And that's what the book hopefully will serve as is, is sort of a, a, a catalyst and a discussion, uh, a fire starter, uh, basically yep. for, for all this discussion. And, you know, people will disagree with some of the ways that we presented information in this book, but that's sort of the nature of this case going back to what we were talking about earlier. Yep. And I, I love that aspect of it because that's what Matt and I've always tried to do with Graveyard Tales is we we don't try to tell you definitively what something is because that's we right. don't know. There there and and too many people in the Earhart case in anything paranormal, they try to come out and they say, This is exactly what it is. This is how mm-hmm. it happened. This is mm-hmm. what uh, what happened to them? This is where they are, and mm-hmm. then you question them about it, and they've got no way of backing it up. So it's all pomp and circumstance, smoke and mirrors. But they want to seem like they have the answers, and right. I, I I like that in in the podcast and in this book that you don't try to sway somebody's opinion. Mm-hmm. And make them think what you think, because yeah. Matt and I always say, like at the end of every episode, tell us what you think. Yeah, and that, that's what's so cool about this book and and all the work you've done. In in my opinion, is that you present the facts, just the facts, ma'am, and mm-hmm. then allow the rest of us to absorb it in whatever way we absorb this information, and. That might allow for new theories to come out Mm -hmm. that might allow for what really happened to come out because, you know, Matt and I like to joke about the young whippersnappers nowadays, you know, (laughs) the, the kids and all that stuff. But you get younger people thinking critically about a topic and they may have as wild as this theory that they have might be, that might be the one. That might actually be, and none of the rest of us old asses have ever thought about it (laughs) because we're stuck in our theories, but they have Mm -hmm. a new theory. And I think that's what's really cool about um, your book and and the podcast in general. 
Yeah, fresh perspectives. It's all about bringing, uh, in- injecting new energy into the case and mm-hmm. injecting different, you know, different ideas, different thoughts. And we've got a lot of, there's a lot of young people that are doing remarkable things uh, in the name of Earhart, in the name of, in this, for the sake of the investigation. There's a lot of that going around now. And it's, you know, as somebody who's, I've, I've only been in it. You know, this is about 20 years of my life. Uh, that's I'm, I'm new compared to a lot of the people that have been doing this 30, 40, 50 years in some cases. You know, right. it's remarkable that could run circles around me. And, you know, those are the stars of the show. I, I say it every time and it, it you know, it's, it's worth repeating. It's like I'm, I'm not certainly not the star of the show. There's a reason why you never see my picture anywhere on any of our promotional material or anything. It's because I don't I don't look at myself. I look at myself as a person behind the camera, uh, you know, producing it, creating the content. I love to create. I love to be in a studio. Uh, it, you know, if you don't love it, then, you know, you, there's a there's a problem. That's when it becomes a job. But I right. I, I love uh, spotlighting everybody else because they're the people that are doing the work. I'm, I'm just sort of mm. reporting on it um, and I'm in a unique position to sort of befriend a lot of a lot of these people. And I've made some really wonderful, uh, you know, formed some really wonderful relationships and and uh, people that I love dearly. And, and I, I'm just such a fan of, uh, you know, and, and that's really uh, what this comes down to. I'm a fan. And this is this book is my love letter, not only to Earhart and to Noonan, but to everybody who's ever come before me, who's worked on this case or is still working on this case right, right. now. Like as we speak, there's people that are, you know, working. There's multiple active investigations going on. And so this is sort of what I can do. This is my help. And and, and if this gets out there into the ether and people start reading it and new uh, people start discovering it and getting familiar with the case of Earhart and that leads to somebody new investigating it and maybe coming up with a discovery that no one else could ever see or could ever, you know, who knows? Uh, that's it's all positive. It's all good. And some people don't agree with that, but I will argue that, you know, forever. That's 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 the name of the game. We we've got to solve this. And I think we will at, at some point. Yep. Back in my past life, um, <laughs> I uh, uh, my pre uh, podcasting life, I I built guitars for a living. Mm. I, I, I did that for 15 years. And I'm not surprised. <laughs> I um, uh, you, you know, look when, like the expert they'd bring in on Pawn Stars to like uh, authenticate a, a Les Paul or something like that, or a, you know, like an old. You look like that. Yeah, that's that's about that looks like a guitar shop owner. I actually yeah. could probably do that. Um, so yeah, if yeah. there's any offers out there, I'll come on and do that. Um, hell yeah. But uh, the, the thing that used to get me all the time when I first started working there, um, mm. I knew a little bit about guitar repair and stuff like that. Cause I've done it on my own. Well, mm-hmm. when I first started, there was what we called the old guard of <laughs> guitar builders. Right. Yeah. And so you'd come in and you'd say, well, how about, I, I, I realize you, you, you set it up like this, but if we do this and then this, before we do that, it'll make it so much easier. Why aren't we doing it? Well, this is right. the way we've always done it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, the way you've always done it is taking extra time and extra work and we can expedite it. Well, no, we're not going to do that because this is the way that this company does it. Mm -hmm. And, and I, somebody literally said to me, why would we listen to you? You've only been working here a year. Mm. And at that point that changed my thought process about so many different things. Just that one statement. Because I was Mm -hmm. like, why would you listen to me? Because I might have a different idea than you, and we might be able to expedite this or figure something out differently. And if every aspect of life does that, well, this is the way we've always done it. Why are we, why would we listen to a new person? We would Mm -hmm. never get anywhere. Right. And so that's what I think about with the Amelia Earhart case is yeah. if we just say, well, this is where we've always looked. These are our theories that we're going off of and we don't want new theories. Then we're mm-hmm. never going to solve it. Yeah. And yeah. You, you have Absolutely. to. Yeah. You may have to weed through some idiots out there that throw out some really stupid ideas, but mm-hmm. that's where the old guard would then come into play and go. We've looked into that. That's stupid. Let, let's let's move on yeah. move past yeah. that because we've we've already uh proven that that's not true 
But mm-hmm. every now and then you might get one that it will advance the case by yeah. leaps and bounds. And sure, it's the, it's the same way with the paranormal stuff that Matt and I have talked about all the time. You've got the old guard of the scientist or whatever that you bring up a new theory to Bigfoot and mm-hmm. they're like, why are you talking about Bigfoot? That's stupid. And then they mm-hmm. shun them and everything. Well, because if we look into Bigfoot, we may learn something new about the natural world that we yeah. didn't know before because you're unwilling to talk about it. So, right. Yeah. Sometimes the ideas are too big. Uh, they're too expansive for smaller minds, uh, mm-hmm. more analytical minds. And, uh, you know, this case is, is full of people that have been looking for a long time and nobody wants to be wrong. I totally sure. respect that position. If you've been studying a, a given theory or championing a given theory or giving everything you've got to something and you have to admit that you're wrong after 30 years, I mean, that's that's a tough pill to swallow. Right. Yeah. And I I respect that position. I understand why they're so, uh, you know, aggressively defensive when it comes to that stuff. I get that. I, I totally get it. But at the same time, you know, do you want, it's like the, you know, it's like the age old marriage argument, right? Like, do you want to, do you want to be right? You know, um, or do you want to be happy or, you know, yeah. that's it's, and it's yep. in this case, it's, you know, do you, are you going to die on that hill or, are you going to open yourself up for uh, maybe being part of a, a team or a collective that, right. dis- that discovers the the finality of this case or any other case that you could really talk about for, for that matter? But Earhart is, is the holy grail because she's been gone for so long and so many people have thrown their hat into the ring and everybody struck out. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see someone like a Jeff Bezos who brought her goggles up into space with him, uh, you know, throw a hundred million dollars into the ring. Uh, everybody who's anybody who, uh, with this case, when it comes, there's multiple billionaires that have thrown their hat into the ring and, uh, you know, it, nobody's been able to find anything yet, but it might take somebody with like an indis- like a, like a, like just a, an endless income, um, that could just give you 150 million to go search the deep oceans for six months or whatever until you find her. Uh, and you know, and you might, you narrow it down close enough. You might, you might find it and you might very well get that answer of it was exactly what Earhart was saying. We must be on you, but cannot see you. And, uh, they just, they just, uh, Tom Detweiler said something really great in the show. It's in the book too. He says a lot of these air disasters, it's not one major thing. It's a lot. It's the sum of a lot of little things mm-hmm. yeah. that add up to them having a really bad day that could very well be the, the, that could be it. It could, it could surely be it. It certainly makes sense. And you, you, you got to factor in the S fives. You got to factor in the closest thing you've got to an eyewitness, which is chief Leo Bellarts, who was on the Atasca, who was talking to her, not, they weren't communicating directly, but they were shouting stuff back and forth and they were going back and forth on it. But it could very well be, uh, you know, a, a non-sexy as, uh, you know, Brian Dunning in the book it says, it not, might not be sexy. It might not be as exciting, but it's there. Yeah. And that might be likely what happened to them. But nobody's produced. So until somebody produces, we don't know. Right. You know, and these things take time. These things take uh, an excruciatingly amount of time. Uh, uh, you know, a very long time to actually make any headway on these types of cases. And it's just one of those scenarios where all of a sudden you're going to get some kind of an announcement at some point and, uh, you know, it's going to shock the world. And I think, like I said, I, I'm optimistic that we'll have that in our lifetimes. I don't think we'll all go to the grave, uh, not knowing it's not going to get to, I don't think it'll get to 200 years or anything. I don't, I really don't, but you know, who knows? It, it depends on how much everybody gets in their own way, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Yep. You know, so, yeah. So to switch up the topic just a little bit. um, Sure. Let's talk Jack the Ripper because. Oh, yeah. uh, The three of us have talked Jack the Ripper uh, before on. Ad nauseum. Yes. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Some people might say, uh, listen to our show. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But this is a question that for both you, Chris, and you, Matt, and get y'all's opinion or your thoughts on this. Now, do you think Jack the Ripper, if it was just one person and it was this one guy, do you think that he was just an evil man? Or do you think there's a potential that a man like him could have been influenced by something demonic where Mm. 
we, you know, we've talked about possessions before. We've talked about demons before, and we know that they can influence your train of thought and your actions. So sure. do you think there's a possibility that somebody who could do something like that to all these women, could there be a paranormal slant to it that we didn't talk about in your season there? Mm, that's an excellent question. I'm uh, so I, I'm I'm for people who are listening out there that want to know more about me than they should probably ever need to know. <laughs> I was born and raised Catholic. Uh, and I, so demonic possession is not unfamiliar to me. I've, right. I've been, you know, I've, I've looked at cases of demonic possession a lot. It's fascinating to me personally. I've never given that much thought, but it would appear, you know, it's, it's interesting you asked that question. Cause I, when we had, we had Forrest on the show, uh, for Ripper, same show, he was one of the guests we had on the show. And I asked him that question, what must the mindset be of a guy who is going to brutally, I mean, I brutally, I, I can't even, I can't even begin to describe how brutal these killings were. Mm -hmm. It's, it's almost, it's one of two things. I think it's, it's, it's a sickness for sure. I mean, he's, he's either obviously a psychopath or just a sickness. Uh, it's, it's, we talked a little bit about the sexual component of things, uh, you know, in early in, I think in the first episode mm -hmm. of the show, if I remember correctly, uh, maybe he, that's just how he got his rocks off a uh, very sickening, uh, or what you're talking about is very sure, very likely that this guy could have been, you know, uh, possessed by a force greater than human beings can understand. And certainly in that time frame, it was, um, you know, you have to look at sort of the uh, the environment of, you know, the environment that bred that yeah. kind of uh, a spree. And there is a um, as far as inspiration is concerned, there is a. And gosh, uh, I had I had Jessica Manor on the show talking about Ripper and she talked about the gentleman that was I think it was in Texas. The, it, well, I don't want to call him gentleman. It was the, the family annihilator uh, and that was in Texas. It's a really famous case. And that yeah. happened before Ripper. And there's we sort of started talking about the idea that maybe this was the same guy that maybe that Ripper uh, moved overseas and mm. decided to pick up his killing spree or his sickness or whatever it was. Maybe he fled the U S because he was trying to get away from that, that scene or that time to put himself in a fresh, um, you know, place or whatever. And the sickness came calling again and he decided to start killing women again. And I gotta tell you some of these, I know you guys saw them with us. Some of these crime scene photos are horrendous. Yeah. The Mary Jane Kelly crime scene photos, mm -hmm. the last canon of the canonical five was the most graphic thing I have ever seen to this day. And I'm, I'm including modern day horror and stuff like that. I yeah. mean, that was what this guy did to Mary Jane Kelly locking that door. She was the only one of the canonical five that was fortunate enough at that time to have a, a room to herself, mm -hmm. you know, in that time frame, And that, imagine a someone like psychopath like that being able to lock the door behind him and take his time. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, it, it takes, it takes a very twisted individual for, for, you know, for, to put very lightly um, to do that. And I think absolutely it's possible that there was a force beyond his control. That was maybe, uh, you know, maybe making him do the things that he was doing or making him kill in the way he was killing and the brute, the brutality of it. Yeah, um, the way he yeah, was I'm, I'm open. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The way he was killing is what made me ask that question is because if you look at it, it seems like some of these could be ritualistic and looks like it. Uh, the, the, the way they were laid out, what he did to the bodies. And I know there is a theory that he was higher up in the, um, the, the rich class of people. Mm -hmm. And during yeah. that time, you know, Matt and I have discussed that they, the, the upper echelon in many countries did seances and, you know, they would dive into the paranormal. Right. It, yeah. It, Matt, do you think there could be a possibility that he did something like that with the people and something got attached to him? Yeah, absolutely. And and when you look at the time frame mm -hmm. um, of the Ripper killings and the spiritualism movement, you know, you're mm -hmm. about probably midway um you know between the 1840s ish uh into the um and in, on into the 1920s you're you're right in the middle of that movement and 
you're right, Adam. The the upper class were the people that were most involved in this. Mm -hmm. Um, so the likelihood that the killer would have had, um, at least, um, a a general knowledge of of spiritualism, of of seances, of uh, mediums, fortune tellings, communing with the dead, those type of things. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's highly likely. Um, but it, it, is it possible that this person was so involved that yeah. they either were under under the influence of of an attachment or believed that they were um, believed? But, yeah, which is the psychosis in it. Yeah, and 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 I say that because there were so many people that capitalized on the spiritualism movement and the gullibility of, of the population at that time, uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, a little bit of smoke and mirrors went a long way, um, to convince people that individuals had some type of, of, of special ability to communicate right. to, to the dead. Yeah. And, and somebody might've had that kind of influence over him to the point where you can almost say this may not have been a single individual. Um, yeah. Maybe there was one individual that, that did the killing, but there was yeah. somebody that e even passively could have been driving it, um, you know, by telling them, look, you know, this, mm -hmm. this is what you need to do. You, yeah. you know, you yeah. want to satisfy, you want this power, um, this is what you're going to have to do. Yeah. Um, so, you, you, yeah. And, and we don't know about that, but it seems like a likely theory based on the time frame and, and what was, um, what, what was the climate, um, mm -hmm. in, in London at that time? Yeah. Uh, that's a, a excellently put. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's wild. And you look at like, we talked about, um, God, is it, um, was Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, I think, were the two that were killed on the 30th, 29th or 30th of September. And they were killed within like a very short time frame of each other. Uh -huh. And it, you look at like Stride. Stride was the one that had her throat cut. Uh, and but it, it like that's that appears that that's all that she had cut. And it seems like she he was maybe maybe he was interrupted uh, yeah. or something and he couldn't finish the job because you look at Stride's autopsy photo and then you look at Catherine Eddowes' autopsy photo. It's a vastly different autopsy photo. Uh -huh. And uh, he, he obviously was able to mutilate Eddowes, uh, you know, more so than Stride. So we talk even Jen and I talk about the idea that maybe Stride wasn't an actual victim of Ripper. Maybe someone just cut you know, uh, cut her throat. And there was so much of that going on at the time, or there was, you know, this idea of this, this serial killer out there that was doing ungodly things to these women. But you know, the idea that maybe, uh, there might've been copycats out there, or mm -hmm. if you're going with the idea that maybe he was being told by a greater force of what to do, maybe he goes to kill Elizabeth stride. And then that force compels him to, for whatever reason, stop, uh, stop what he's doing and just slit her throat, which is horrible in and of itself. But he doesn't mutilate her like he does the rest of them. Yep. And when he gets to Mary Jane Kelly, it's it, the, the MO is different. The, the, she was much younger than the women, the other women that he, uh, a part of the, at least part of the canonical five. I know there was a couple of other ones before the canonical five, uh, that were attributed to Ripper that are not, you know, I guess, part of that, um, that guarantee that that's, you know, who killed him. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there's there's so much to that case and to that that uh, the identity of, of who Jack the Ripper was and was he uh, this demonically possessed guy uh, or men or women who know we don't know. And that's kind of the um, I re I try to go very gingerly around this. It's, it's not in the same vein as obviously a lot of the other cases we cover. Uh, like Earhart that we've been talking about tonight and D.B. Cooper and some of these other ones. And this was a horrible, horrible person. And uh, you, you have to imagine that maybe uh, it, he was so horrible that it goes beyond him being a, a he, just merely flesh and blood human and that maybe it was a demon that latched yep. onto him or possessed him and decided, you know, I think until you make that discovery, 
and you determine exactly who it was. You know, we have a uh, spoiler alert for anybody who's listening to this, but it's been a couple years now. But Montague John Druitt, who we, uh, you know, I, I posited was Ripper, was a pretty, you know, de- lowly depressed, uh, successful, uh, very successful guy, but depressed individual. And a lot of times depression uh, leads to anger, which leads to uh-huh. psychosis, which leads to Jack the Ripper potentially and all that stuff. So, you know, yeah, you either got some kind of severely deep psychosis going on here uh, or someone that is, uh, yeah, has been, you know, positioned or or touched for lack of a better term uh by a, a spirit that's um not a good one you know yeah. and that's it's causing him to do all these things so yeah it's it's all on the table as far as i'm concerned and we when we looked into um possessions um the couple times that we did it we we learned that if you have if you're in a state of depression or anger or whatever Mm -hmm. um that's a chip in your armor against demons and they will use that opening to attach themselves to you and that's why you'll see people that they seem depressed for a while or whatever and then all of a sudden it makes this turn into possession and it's because they were uh, you know, drug addiction is the same way that you're mm-hmm. you're not in your full capacity, so you're not able to fend off this demonic possession. So yeah. if it was that guy um, that you mentioned and he was depressed, it mm-hmm. could have turned to this possession because he was depressed and vulnerable, and then something just took advantage of him and his maybe desires that he had anyway and just Mm -hmm. blew it out of proportion into into what it became as jack the ripper um amplified it yeah and i and i know our you know our, our our policing at the time was not what we have now and we don't have the ability to um go back and and view what happened like we would now but it has always been weird to me that he was able to get away mm-hmm. like yeah. he did because yeah. I, I forgot which victim it was, but it seemed like it had just happened when her body was discovered. So where did he go? This guy that was covered in blood, you know, couldn't have uh, uh, come out clean yeah, you know, right. so he would stand out in a crowd even at the time at night you would see this guy running with blood on him. So how did he get yeah. away? What is, uh, how did that happen? And yeah. so I always have felt like, and I didn't bring it up when we talked about it in that episode, because um, leave the, the crazy talk to graveyard <laughs> tales. You know, you can seem a little weird here, mm. um, but I've always thought there was something not just abnormal, but paranormal to that case. Sure. Um, now, like I sure. said, with the Earhart thing, that's where my brain always goes. I always try yeah. to, is there something that we're not looking at, we're not investigating because it's too on the crazy side? Mm-hmm. Uh, my brain always goes to the crazy side to see if I can make it fit. And mm. half the time it doesn't fit. Sometimes it does, but, you know. I I thought I would crazy get y'all's opinion fits. on it. What are you talking about? It yeah, that's does. True. That's, true. <laughs> that's why it's crazy because it always fits. Right, right. Yeah, you you can make it. You can make it as is as, uh, as outlandish <laughs> as you as you want. Uh, that's kind of the you know that's kind of the name of the game in a lot of these things. But I, no, I agree with you. I mean, it, you know, it takes a special and not in a good way someone to to be able to do the things that Ripper did, and. It's a. It's been amazing to see, uh, sort of on another aspect of Ripper. It's been amazing to see the. It's like a multi-million dollar industry, uh, with all these people that are you know writing books and making movies and you know what was the movie with Johnny Depp in it where he was supposed to, you know with yeah. Jack the Ripper and about yeah. Jack the Ripper and like just all these different 
you oh, know, that really was from um, hell, wasn't it? Wasn't the name from, from hell? hell. Yep. That's right. That's yeah. So like you see all this stuff and like uh, there was a, a, a an animated, you know, guilty pleasure for me, an animated Batman movie that came out where he ba- I think it was Gotham by Gaslight, I think it was called. And it's all about Batman tracking down Jack the Ripper, which is like a really interesting you know, they get real fun with the animation on those and, and like huh. the animation. And it, it's I like, recall, it was, I think I remember that not that long ago. I mean, I think I watched it uh, last year or something or the yeah. year before. I remember seeing, it, I was like, Oh wow, that's an interesting approach to it. But there, you know, Jack the Ripper has been popularized. Uh, this mm. is a horrific crime. Uh, it's not unlike Ted Bundy being a sexy, you know, yeah. a lot of women that are, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how that sort of materializes, you know, and how these cases transform in the public eye and become these pop culture icon, uh, you know, icons, uh, for, for, you know, for better or for worse, but you have people like DB Cooper who a lot of people don't believe, you know, believe that that was a victimless crime. Well, he hijacked and ter- basically terrorized the flight crew, uh, for hours. And, you know, yep. what's interesting and remarkable, uh, you know, it seems really about that case is that they, uh, you know, I know we're shifting into Cooper, but it, it sort of it sort of relates. This guy is on board this plane. He's a cool as a cucumber. He rarely raises his voice, if ever. He's smoking all these cigarettes and he's just chilling in the back. He's got this suit on and these glasses on. Right. Nobody, nobody ever suspects that the plane is being hijacked. And they mm-hmm. they they deplane all the passengers. And as the passengers are getting off the plane, they're like, yeah, you guys were just hijacked. And he was like, everybody's saying, what? Like, what's going on? He was that calm and, and cool and collected. And they say that's a victimless crime, but it's not a victimless crime because he, he terrorized those, you know, those people right. that were on board, you know, as part of the flight crew. Uh, you know, so you look at someone like Jack the Ripper, who is it's leaps and bounds, a, a worse scenario than than D.B. Cooper, of course. But, you know. These people like what what drives them to do it? You know, what is it? Is it just something as, as simple as, you know, uh, or, or uh, animalistic or, or anything like that is revenge? Uh, or is it one of those scenarios where people uh, are truly twisted individuals? Uh, there's lots of psychosis involved. There may be some paranormal aspects involved. You know, I guess we'll never know, but I think until you turn over a suspect in that case for Ripper uh, or, you know, a suspect for Cooper, for that matter, you're not going to really know psychologically what was going on with this person at the time, uh, you know, and, and if, if paranormal is in play. I, I feel like that that's kind of always in play with those really crazy murdering sprees like Richard Ramirez. That shit was paranormal. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, yep. you're not going to he was he was a psycho, pure and simple, mm-hmm. but you don't hang people upside down St. Anthony style and everything on a wall in their home. If you're not possessed by some kind of an evil, right. right. You know, so like it's not just, well, the guy was crazy. Okay. Well, that's kind of cut and dry. You know, you want something that is a little more concrete. And when you can't explain it by purely psychosis, then it must be on another plane. It must yep. be on another level. Yep. And I feel like, uh, you know, as someone who is, as I said in the beginning, born and raised, you know, a Catholic, I'm not unfamiliar with with those kinds of cases. And if you look at like the, you know, the, the Emily Rose film and, you know, the exorcist and all the stuff that's in pop culture, you know, it's it's uh, the conjuring. Great example. Right. Like, you know, they go to court over that shit. I mean, it's uh-huh. like there's a trial on it and they're testifying. The Warrens are testifying on, st- on the stand about demonic possession, you know, in the, in the latest film about this kid, you know, that was demonically possessed. So, you know, is it prevalent? Absolutely. Uh, you know, is it is it, you know, the pure truth? I mean, I guess, you know, that's why we keep investigating these things. Yep. Um, that's but yeah, why it's there's... considered paranormal and not uh, fact. Yeah, it, it, my my father and I don't really talk about this too much, but, you know, uh, my father is a uh, is a pastor and he has I've I've talked to him uh, for hours, uh, you know, off off the record about, you know, I've asked him, like, have you ever done any exorcisms? And he said, mm-hmm. yeah, I've done quite a few exorcisms. Yeah. Uh, it's very real. It's very real. Uh, demonic possession is is not you don't mess with that. Uh, you know, and these these are people that would you know they know. I think they would know. I think they would have a healthy respect for it. Yeah. And uh, I, I've asked him many times, like, would you come on the show and talk about it? He's like, well, we'll never. I'll never talk about it. He goes because it's not. It's 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 not something that you talk. You don't bring that into your life. You don't speak that over your life. My wife is. Um, you know, uh, very much a Christian and very much into the idea that, uh, that you don't speak that kind of evil over your life. You don't invite, you don't give it any window, um, you know, in, into your world. And, um, 
I think that's the reality of it. People that are sort of, uh, you know, in that niche or can talk about it and everything, um, I think have a healthy understanding of, of the seriousness of it. Uh, you know, you're not getting it. You guys, when you guys talk about it, you treat it with such respect, you know, on the show. And, and I think there, there's so much of that that needs, needs to be present in these conversations. Otherwise, you know, what are we doing here? You know, this is, this is not just to, mm-hmm. to poke fun at stuff. These are people that lost their lives um, at the hands of these truly evil people yep. that are out there in this world. And the, the sad truth is this is a, not a, 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 this is a dark world that we live in. There's a lot of evil people. Sure. And I think if, if you just lifted laws tomorrow and there was no laws in the U S you'd really start seeing some shit, you know, Probably. some people would really get really crazy, you <laughs> yeah. know, uh, why do we do that is because we, you know, we're, we're human. We're, uh, you know, we all have animalistic urges. We all have these things, but you know, uh, you've, I mean, who's never wanted to like punch somebody out or strangle somebody because you're so enraged about something, but you obviously, you know, the people that are not psycho <laughs> psycho do, but you, right. you also hear about all these, these, um, accidental killings uh where these where these people just black out and they don't remember what mm-hmm. they did or what happened uh yeah. now you know could 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 ripper be the case could that be the case for ripper could it be such a, a case where he uh was a it was like a dr jekyll mr hyde kind of thing he wasn't really an evil guy uh per se but he was sort of taken over by these things and would do things uh, you know who knows i i'm not i can't speculate on that but i yeah i, I definitely i definitely uh put a lot of um, stock into the idea that this was not just some crazy dude that decided to start yeah. killing women in Whitechapel. Like this is, this goes deeper than that. And um, you mentioned exorcisms. Yeah. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know it, but I heard recently that um, the percentage of exorcisms just in the United States <laughs> over the past five, 10 years has grown exponentially probably 40 percent more it's wild exorcisms yeah. now than what they used to be yet we don't talk about it right. and it's not publicized and people don't know this and but the catholic church has put more people through exorcism training and has more people available to perform exorcisms now mm-hmm. than they have had in a century or more because people are requesting exorcisms and having exorcisms done so often. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a curious fact um, to me that that's the case. And, you know, skeptics will say, well, it's just, they're trying something. They, they have Mm -hmm. a a mental issue and they're, they're trying something and it's not Mm -hmm. really, uh, demonic possession, but then yeah. I think about it. Well, if that's the case, then why are they working? <laughs> right, they should you be know? out of business. If it's uh, you know, right. and that's that's the question. Is it is it, the forty percent jump you're talking about? Is that because? Uh, it's, it's, it's more, uh, is society slipping, you know, as a, just as a general, you know, people are becoming uh, more susceptible to demonic possession. Mm-hmm. They say that the Catholic faith states that in, in, in so many words that, uh, you know, if, if you're demonically possessed, you're, you're weak in your faith and, you know, sure that's possible. It's getting harder and harder to stay faithful in this time with, you know, where, you know, we won't, we, I know we won't get into politics and we won't get into all that stuff. And, and, you know, but you know, with where the country's going, with where the world is going, let's just throw out country. Let's just say the, where the world is going yeah. and everything we're experiencing. It's maybe this is, uh, all of this is allowing demonic possession to slip in and to take yep. over otherwise, uh, very, you know, kind and normal people that normally wouldn't have that, uh, you know, that in where they can mm-hmm. sort of slip in. And as my wife says, you, you don't, you just don't speak it over your life because when you do that kind of stuff, it, it really, you know, it allows, a, it opens a window and it, it yeah. doesn't take much for, as you have seen, if you've done research on demonic possession, I know you guys have and exorcisms, you know that most of these, these weren't like psychotic people for the long, for their whole lives or anything. They were just regular people that happened to get, that got possessed and it just, everything mm-hmm. just changed on a dime for them. And they became a different person. How many family members have you done te- read testimonies from that say that they were never 
anything like this before prior to this and it just sort of came on quick and happened very fast you know that's a really interesting aspect of the whole sort of discussion is uh, is this something that's pre-planted in specific people from for from birth maybe or even you know who knows how far back it would go or is this something where something happened there was an instance or an event or a turning point where that person opened themselves up to demonic possession and then once Mm -hmm. it got hold you can't ever let it go you know and and it it causes you to do some horrific things which you know sort of takes us back to maybe uh, a root cause for this whoever jack the ripper was yep Yeah. yeah And I, I don't know. I it, it's a it's an interesting thought to me that um there could be that many more demonic possessions now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now is it is it that there's more? Is it that people now rather than fifty years ago know where to go for help? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, where before they just weren't getting exorcisms because they didn't know to and, and they were living yeah. with it. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. But more popularized, more resources, easier to document now. Mm-hmm. You know, all that stuff comes with, you know, mankind moving forward. And I think that's, you know, technology is a wonderful thing. It can do a lot of really great things in a lot of these cold cases and a lot of these investigative scenarios. But, you know, you see all this stuff with, uh, you know, ghost hunters and, you know, all these different shows. It's it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh-huh. Paranormal industry, you guys know. I mean, I don't have to, as I'm preaching to the choir here, it's a multi-billion dollar industry yep. with all these different shows. You know, and I'll sit back and my wife and I will, you know, we'll get in, we'll get into bed and we'll watch a goat. We'll run, run through some ghost hunters just for fun. You know, it's like, it's, it's a, it becomes like a guilty pleasure. It becomes like a pop culture reference, something that entertains you right with movies and documentaries and all these different things. And the idea is to make it scary so that you can feel a little scared, but be safe because you know, ah, oh, that is not going to happen to me. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I, I've I've seen of of cases or heard of cases where demonic possession is absolutely real, uh, and, and it's very possible that it could very well happen to you. And uh, I don't I don't take that shit lightly at all. No. I mean, I I'm very you know serious about that. And I yeah, I mean, I love that you brought that up, and I, I love that you talked about that angle sort of for Ripper because I, I think the more you talk about it, the more it sort of seems plausible that this guy. Uh, that it's it wasn't just this guy, and and I say this guy because I b- firmly believe that Ripper probably was a man. There are some instances where people think, well, he might have been, it might have been a woman, or it might have been multiple people. It might have been a spree. That could explain the Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes deal. If they were a uh-huh. tag team, if they were still like doing a scream, you know, where there were two killers. Maybe. I mean, that would explain why one could get across town and kill, you know, uh, kill and mutilate Meadows while the other one slit you know, uh, strides throat, yep. uh, that would explain that perfectly. Uh, you know, and so that's, that's one of those deals, but I, I really believe he was a lone guy. Uh, and I believe that, uh, you know, it, it's a tough, it's a tough thing, whether or not we'll ever know for sure, uh, who Jack the Ripper was. And that's really a shame because the victims, the women should be, uh, who we talk about. It should not be this shadowy figure uh-huh. that did these horrible things to these women. It should be the women and the lives they lived. And, you know, there's a lot of rumor. Uh, there's a lot of people. We talked about this on the, on our very own show about, you know, hey, they were they were they were prostitutes. And so people looked at them as, you know, lower forms of life or something like that. And that's just disgusting to me uh, to the idea that, that you know, these were women with dreams. Yeah. Dreams. They had families. Mm-hmm. They had, you know, they, all that stuff. And, you know, that was a, a, a horrid, horrid time to be in in that place and time and that that. um in Whitechapel. And, you know, they were just doing what they could to survive, to be able to live and to be able to exist and to be able to be disposed. Yeah. Uh, the perfect word, Matt, for that. I mean, it, to be able to be uh, disposed like that uh, is is horrific. And I think whoever, uh, you know, I, I hope I hope that whoever did it is, is is burning right now. And I think that that's that's really the only solace you can take as somebody who's, uh, you know, has has faith or has a, a belief uh, that, you know, hey, the, the bad people do get punished. They do have to come face to face with God or, you know, whatever you believe. I, you know, I don't I don't push that on anybody. But 
uh, I personally believe that, you know, everybody's going to have to come face to face uh, with God and, and be able to sort of rationalize their lives and rationalize what they did. And mm-hmm. how do you rationalize that? It's it's yeah. a physical impossibility. I mean, you know, whether he was possessed or not, uh, that's terrible. Uh, you know, it, you, that opens up the conversation of all kinds of different things. If this guy's possessed and he, if someone if someone's possessed and they kill 10 or 12 people, uh, but they're possessed and it's proven in a court of law that they weren't in their right mind, should they go to prison forever? That's a crazy yeah. difficult question to answer and to tackle. Yeah, it is. Uh, if this was a modern day thing, let's say Montague John Drew was Ripper and he was tried. I mean, he took the easy way out. He committed suicide and was found floating in the floating in the Thames. But, you know, if if he had been brought to justice and deemed crazy for killing these women in the way he did, should he go to prison because he was not in his right mind? Or should he be institutionalized? I mean, that's such a difficult question to answer. Oh, it is. Brighter minds, is, yeah. brighter minds than me. I don't even weigh in on that, really. I, I just kind of like, I just ask the question yeah. uh, and let smarter right. people talk about it than me. But it, it is a fascinating question to ask. And it's it's a fascinating angle to consider when it comes to Jack the Ripper. Absolutely. So uh, to kind of close this out here, uh, tell us what's yeah. next for you, what you got coming up uh in the future here for vanished and books or anything like that Hmm. well hopefully lots uh we've got the idea now is that you know Earhart's out she's out in the ether now and it's it was that was my sort of my as i said my coup de gras on Earhart. i i I sort of go back and forth on that but yeah more books for sure Uh, the next one and i we just announced this so i could talk about it now but db cooper is next and db cooper i'm a big fan of anniversaries for anybody who's listened to our show they know that i'm, I'm a i'm an anniversary nut <laughs> and so uh the, the plan uh, right now is to release db cooper on thanksgiving eve of this year which is a uh, the one year anniversary of the date we recorded that show uh and 51 years to the day that cooper skyjacked uh northwest uh, northwest uh orient airlines uh, and um he uh, is a fascinating individual. And so we're going to do that book and we're going to have uh, all the guests return uh, feature the original testimony in, in the show. And we're going to have hopefully lots of new testimony, uh, more so new, more new testimony in this one than even the Earhart book, hopefully. And we've got some really special figures that have that that didn't couldn't make that show originally, but are going to participate in the book, which is a really special thing for me. And that'll come out on on Thanksgiving Eve, and then we're going to move to April 26th of uh, next year for Jack for uh, John Wilkes Booth, and we'll tell that story uh, based off of the original show, and we'll have new commentary and new stuff on it, and and sort of go from there. And then we'll we'll sometime in the autumn of next year we'll do Jack the Ripper, uh, and then then we'll see. And, and season three of Vanished is going to be out. Um, at some point, I don't have an ETA. We typically <laughs> start recording around Halloween. It really depends a lot on Jen's schedule. Cause as I said, she's got a lot on the, on, on the plate. So we'll, we're actually going to, I'm actually going to see Jen in a couple of days. I know we're recording this, uh, uh, on the 13th of July, but we're going to be having a, a big, uh, event at the Amelia Earhart festival. I return to the Earhart festival in Atchison, Kansas, uh, on Saturday. So just a couple of days. Uh, from now and um yeah i mean we're gonna see each other in person and and so we'll talk about season three i'm sure but yeah that's the plan season three we'll cover uh we got a stacked plate for season three we're gonna cover alcatraz zodiac uh jimmy hoffa jesse james and amy johnson so we're gonna cover a pretty stellar amount of of uh you know list of cases and we're gonna put our own spin on it and we'll see sort of how season three is received. And uh, that's, yep. that's basically cool. everything on the plate. Yeah, that's that's where we're at right now. So lots yeah. of work. I know I'm looking forward to uh, those cases and hearing what y'all do with them. Because um, mm. like you said, you put your own spin on it, which I think yeah. is, is cool. Because those cases, anybody can talk about them. But mm. the, uh, to bring up what matt said earlier the easily digestible way that Mm -hmm. y'all do it it, it's Mm -hmm. fascinating to me so yeah um, thank you yeah i appreciate that yeah we're 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 loving the show we're having a good time it's it's a lot of work as you guys know and you know it's a show that we enjoy putting on and the trial by jury aspect is a lot of fun it gives you know that's certainly not my wheelhouse but you know jen is is a master and 
we get to we get to cover these cases and have a lot of fun and and step outside of Earhart, which is, you know, Jack the Ripper was a special case for me to cover because that was the only the first case I'd covered outside of Earhart ever. Mm-hmm. And I was I was, as you know, I think I even talked to you offline about this, Adam, but I was really hesitant to yeah. talk about anything other than Earhart or do a season two on anything other than Earhart. And it was it really uh, to my wife's credit for pushing, as she always does. Uh, into Jen saying, you know, I think we're going to probably be all right with that. I think people will listen to it and people will get something out of it because of mm-hmm. the way we approach it. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's what we've been doing. And, and we love doing the show. And hopefully we'll have many more years of the show together and uh, we'll continue to evolve the show you know, to where it's a little bit more polished and and all that jazz. And um, yeah, for now, we've got we've got this book. We've got this book that's out and it's it's out there now. And hopefully people will go read it and you know and share share their thoughts with us that's that's the whole idea of this thing generate discussion like we've been doing tonight yep yeah exactly yeah so uh where can what's the title and where can people find the book yeah so the book is called rabbit hole the vanishing of amelia Earhart and fred noonan and uh you can find it pretty much anywhere you you can get your books it's on amazon of course uh, it's on barnes and noble it's on walmart and it's in a bunch of uh, online independent bookstores which i'm very proud of and hopefully we'll get into some brick and mortar stores but if you want to get a, a copy directly from me and, and we really do put a lot of effort into sort of the presentation of the copies and the way we ship them and the way they receive by people that are reading uh, you can go to into the rabbit uh, and you can order a copy of the book uh, whether it's signed or unsigned whatever you want and uh we'll we'll get you what you need and uh we're we're real excited about it so awesome. it's it's a it's a great book and we hope that uh, everybody picks it up and and enjoys it yep well i will get that uh link from you and put it in the show description here so people can uh easily click that and get over there to buy a book from you so well thank you thank you sir appreciate uh, that we uh we appreciate you coming on and yeah. uh talking with us and you know, uh, putting up with our weird thoughts <laughs> on things. So I, I love this. You guys look, you guys are friends. Uh, I have a, I have an immense amount of respect for you both. And, uh, Adam, you and I, you know, we, we talk offline all the time. Uh, you know, you guys, you did sleepy. You were kind enough to, to narrate sleepy hollow for us way back when, when we did that a little fun experiment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you guys, of course, you know, appear alongside us with Ripper. I mean, I'm, I'm always genuinely, um, honored to be on the show and to uh, to spend time with you guys. So thank you, yeah. Chris. It's always a pleasure. Um, it, it always seems like you know once we get started, we just we just it just mm-hmm. goes and goes and goes. It's like four hours later, but that, yeah. But those those are the yeah. best conversations, and uh, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing that with uh, members of the graveyard. Yeah, true honor. Thank you guys both. All right, so amazing interview there with our buddy chris williamson and we want to say thank you again to chris for coming on and talking to us and if you want to pick up his book i'm going to put a link to the website so you can order it down in the show notes like he said you can also get it on amazon and all that other stuff but if you want to get it directly from him the best way to do it use that link that i'm going to put in the show notes yep and so again uh thanks to chris uh we really appreciate uh, him taking the time to Uh, talk to us tonight and don't forget to go by and check out our website it is graveyardpodcast.com and on our site you can listen to the show you can find links to purchase graveyard tells merchandise and you can and you can become a patron and we appreciate everyone that has donated to the show because it really keeps us going um when you have your own stories your own jokes your own whatevers get in our facebook group it is called the graveyard and one thing we had a listener point out uh, we want to make sure everybody understands uh we call this a safe place to share those personal experiences because it is it is a private group what you post in the graveyard will only be seen by the graveyard so we want to make sure everybody knows that you know you if you post a story that uh, about some experience that you had and you're worried oh man my boss is gonna see this and he's gonna think i'm a nut don't worry about that uh, right. and if your boss is in the graveyard then he's right along with you yep, so he's fine he, he wants to hear the good stories too <laughs> um so i i don't know again thanks to chris williamson for adam and myself we'll save you a seat in the graveyard see you soon